Hello, my name is Anne Marie Cannon, and I'm the host of Armchair Historians. What's your favorite history? Each episode begins with this one question. Our guests come from all walks of life. YouTube celebrities, comedians, historians, even neighbors from the small mountain community that I live in. They're people who love history and get really excited about a particular time, place, or person from our distant or not so distant past. The jumping off point is the place where they became curious, then entered the rabbit hole into discovery. Fueled by an unrelenting need to know more, we look at history through the filter of other people's eyes. Armchair Historians is a Belgian Rabbit production. Stay up to date with us through Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Wherever you listen to your podcast, that is where you'll find us. Armchair Historians is an independent, commercial-free podcast. If you'd like to support the show and keep it ad-free, you can buy us a cup of coffee through Ko-fi, or you can become a patron through Patreon. Links to both in the episode notes. Before we get started today, I'd like to take a moment to recognize and suggest a podcast that I personally love. Care More, Be Better is a podcast with heart and soul. Hosted and produced by Corinna Beliza, Care More, Be Better is a podcast that shares stories of inspired individuals, social entrepreneurs, and conscious companies from around the globe who create a positive impact in their communities. From pay-it-forward marketers to not-for-profits and community activists, the stories they feature will get you thinking about what you can do differently to be the change you want to see in the world. I urge you to give it a listen. To find out more, check out our episode notes. In this episode of Armchair Historians, I talk to Impressions of America podcast co-host Simon Heptonstall. You may remember a couple weeks back, we talked to another of the Impressions of America co-hosts, Vaughn Joy, about how American culture is reflected in Christmas films during the Cold War period. If you haven't done so already, I strongly recommend that episode. Impressions of America is a podcast which looks at the wider subjects of culture, politics, and media that formed American life in the latter 20th century. Today specifically, Simon focuses on the representation, reflection, and deconstruction of America during the second half of the 20th century through film and television. He shows us how nestled within the TV shows and films of that time period are reflections of the social, cultural, and political events that shaped U.S. history. Simon Heptonstall, welcome and thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. So excited to get your point of view of what really goes on in Impressions of America. Because I interviewed Vaughn, as you know, and I'm working my way around. Hopefully I'll get to Toby (laughs) next. So Simon, we just really start out with what's your favorite history you're going to be talking about today and off to the races. Off to the races. Well, first of all, I think that's a a great open-ended question. And I think that's what makes your podcast really interesting. Um, For me, it's the second half of the 20th century in general, uh, which I just love. But to be more accurate, it would be the representation, reflection and deconstruction of America through film and television, specifically how film and television views uh, social, cultural and political movement and events uh, in the second half of the 20th century. Um, so be that the, the the growth in teenage culture that was depicted in the, the films of the 50s and 60s or how the uh, TV and film of the 1990s depicted post-war in modern America, such as The Simpsons, Forrest Gump, Fight Club, Truman Show. Uh, oh, wow. You could, you, you could kind of say that I fell in love with how film and TV framed America. So uh, that that's that's me. That is interesting. That's as interesting as Vaughn's uh, take on <laughs> Christmas movies and the Cold War. Yeah. So is that now is that something that you studied in university? Yeah. So my background initially was I went to college for two years and did television production. So that was more on the sort of actual editing and filming side of things. And then I went to university and sort of did the more theoretical side of things. 
and that's where yeah i studied media history and sort of film history and things like the birth of the teenage culture and i just loved it. it it it's really within my wheelhouse you know things like the studio system of hollywood and that kind of thing so anything that depicts the 20th century in general i'm interested in but specifically things around kind of media and how it how we take it in and how it reflects our society i'm just i'm all over that kind of taking a step back i was just thinking about what makes kind of history in general really interesting and it's this idea that you know different people can take different their own perspectives in, into the history you know for example I've internalized the American 20th century as like a, a three-act structure. So with the first act, you're, you're moving from the 1890s, the continued immigration from Europe, the rise of the KKK, through the Great Depression, the New Deal of the 1930s, and then you're transitioning into Act Two, which is, you know, World War Two and America becoming a superpower, the economic growth of the 50s, the, the Cold War, counterculture of the 60s and 70s voting rights and civil rights extension you've got uh, vietnam the economic troubles and then watergate and so over that middle period you've kind of got a great uh, you know you've got growth and you've got change and you've got decline and that's where specifically a lot of my interest comes in as far as you know the media that depicts that kind of period period just because there is so much change within in america from the sort of 50 to late 70s period and then Act three, as I think of it, is kind of 1980 onwards, which is really Reagan kind of rebirthing America, as it were, with the military spending and the Reaganomics kind of reshaping America for the next 40 years. And Reagan basically won the war on government spending and deregulation. And then you have the Cold War and Fukuyama's end of history and uh, kind of the economy turning around in the mid and late 90s. And so by the end of the 90s, America's kind of at this position where it's gone through all these different transition periods and it's starting to look back and reflect on the 20th century. And you see that a lot in the media that it's producing. And it's also starting to look ahead at the possibilities of the 20, 21st century. And then the 20th century essentially ends with 9-11 or maybe Gore losing to Bush, which resets the tone for the next 20 years with the war on terror, the economic crash of 08, President Trump. But all those things that have been terrible by the 21st century all grew from what came before it in the 20th century, be that American foreign policy, financial deregulation, or a social and economic and political climate that allowed Trump to rise to power and then eventually become president. And that's what's so great about history is we can talk about the 20th century being, you know, the 1890s to 2001, but you can always trace the cause of the events uh, that are like happening today, you know, to the the things we just talked about in the 20th century so any study of the 20th century is also a study of today and that's why i want to talk about how the media has and continues to represent and reflect um and, and deconstruct the 20th century because how we process and review events is so very clearly linked to the content that we consume especially these days when we have so much control uh, over, over the media that we we watch and read and I, I think something i've grown to realize over the over the last few years is the actual time period of the 1950s to the 1990s is really interesting but i'm specifically interested in how we kind of depict review and deconstruct not just the time period but also the media of that time and um i guess that's what I'm fascinated by. No, I love that. I was just thinking how I could take that clip and that could be like a very um, concise and um, kind of history of the United States. I could have never e even said that. And and I think I learned a couple things from it as well. Um, I was going to say, and we leave out so much, you know, I didn't even touch upon a thousand other things and I didn't, you know, I didn't touch upon television and the internet and everything else, but th there's so much that you can take in the 20th century. And just for me, it's so fascinating because there are so many divots to go into and there are so many ways that you can reflect upon things. And because the 20th century is still so close for a lot, I mean, a lot of the people that are around in power today came out of the, the late 20th century. And for me, that's fascinating to be able to to reflect upon that and, and specifically in how we depict that in the media. One of the things that fascinates me about you and your show, Vaughn is American and you are Scottish. We're talking to you. You're in Scotland. I'm in Georgetown, Colorado. And why this history? Why American 
pop culture. I read that you, when you were growing up in Scotland, you said you grew up in Scotland on a steady diet of American movies, music, and TV. What was that like? And then kind of let's segue back into your adult life and what you're, you know, focusing on now. So I was born in 89, which is kind of like the perfect period for taking in the, the, the 90s culture in the late 90s and the sort of early 2000s. So for me, growing up, there was a lot of like, you know, you're watching The Simpsons on TV or you're watching The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And one of the things you sort of realize when you're a bit older is that something like The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was the first time I watched an all-black cast on TV. And it was the first time I'd heard, heard you know, Malcolm X or I'd heard Martin Luther King. And the same with The Simpsons, you know, you're hearing about Richard Nixon and George Bush and then Futurama, you hear your, you know, Spiral Agnew and all these kind of things. So from a looking back at it now perspective, it, it's clear there were there were certain perfect storms, as it were, that allowed me to kind of get into some of the things that I'm interested in. But I suppose just taking it back in general, so much of the content I was consuming when I was a little kid moving forward was American. You know, I watched the Rugrats when I was like five years old, you know, this little cartoon, which actually looking back at it now is actually kind of fascinating, the stuff that they talk about. But so much of the content I can I consumed was American. And so I, I think there was a natural instinct of like, America is where it's happening. America is where the content is being created. It's where the bigger stories are happening. It, You know, you just the films that you see on TV you know, or you go to the cinema to watch, you know, so many of them are American and you're just being bombarded with this idea of America being at the sort of cultural epicenter of, of the world. And I think for my, myself and many people of my generation, you know, you, you kind of grow up and you, you just get fascinated by this world, which is very similar to ours. You know, the, it's not like we're looking at some radical alien race, you know, people look the same and most of the language is the same. And, you know, a lot of the cultural touchstones are the same, but at the same time, there's real differences as well. And so that's kind of fascinating as well. You know, over here, you know, we don't have gun culture, but in America you do, or, you know, things like that. And it, it, it's fascinating to see, something which is so close to yourself but also quite different in certain aspects and certain you know growing up in scotland this idea of you know going to northern california and having you know this beautiful sunny weather to to go to you know and you know going on these wonderful beaches and you know surfing and all this kind of stuff it's it's very different than growing up in the scottish highlands where the weather's just different and so that this chance to see another world through this uh, this America as it's shown on TV is just it it was fascinating for me. That is really interesting, and I told you before we started that I'm an Anglophile. I love the UK, Ireland, Scotland, and England, and so I was trying to understand what that would be like as you were talking. You know, like the gun culture. I can't even imagine. It's like I feel like I have to keep apologizing for how stupid we are. And when I lived in the UK, one of the things that became really clear to me is that people uh, who lived there knew my history better than I knew my history. And I felt ashamed of that. Like, you guys always read the newspaper. Like, I remember I'd get on the tube and there was always those free newspapers and people were always re I never read the newspaper. That's the thing I like about your show is that you guys are so smart. I really like to have these conversations, and I'm not a historian. I'm not really an academic. I studied writing in grad school, but you guys are able to distill this information in a way that I can understand it, which I really appreciate. And I've learned a lot just from listening to the shows I've listened to that you guys do. So what was that like? Can I just ask you? I know this is another sidebar. What was that like, like starting to understand this country who's put producing this content that you're watching and seeing the gun culture? I'm really curious about that. Gun culture is an odd one for us because it is kind of so alien. In a certain extent, we kind of just associate with America because there are certain sort of aspects of this kind of freewheeling American independent individual society where i have you know the rights to own a gun and you know this kind of thing but also you know up on the screen this idea if you know you've got, you've got your you your western figures your cowboys you know either the figure with the gun or you've got this vengeful figure of you know someone seeking revenge with the gun and i guess for us it was 
almost one of those things where you just have to put to one side and you go, that is just different to how life is over here. And I, not to make it too serious, but you know, what one of the things which is just so abhorrent to us is you know, the school shootings which happen in America and the, the violence and this idea that nothing changes. And as a contrast, when I was younger, there was a school shooting in Scotland where uh, a man went into a school and uh, sh shot some children. And in fact, I don't know if you know the tennis player Andy Murray, uh, who won who won some Grand Slams and he was world number one. He was actually at he was actually there the day it happened, and it was called Dunblane, and it kind of changed how some gun culture, some gun laws in Scotland worked and tightening up of security around schools. And that was one event and that kind of shocked us to the core. And we weren't really a much of a gun nation anyway, but whatever restrictions there were kind of amplified after that. And so for us watching on and seeing, you know, Sandy Hook or, you know, whatever it is. And just, I don't know if I talked about this to Vaughn, but just some telling you a little bit about myself. I lived in Newtown and I worked in the coffee shop where all the community members came, the teachers, the kids, uh, half a mile from there when it happened. I'd worked there for 11 years. It completely destroyed me. And that's how I ended up in Colorado. So I, 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 I'm with you. It's abhorrent to me that we have this gun culture. This idea that American children have you know, drills that they do where they hide under desks and stuff. And I, I've spoken to Vaughn about this, about some of the experiences she's had. And it's just, it is. Abhorrent. So yeah, that was a sidebar. Don't know if it'll be in it or if it'll be an outtake sure. at some point, but I really was curious about that. And then I felt like I, you said Sandy Hook and anyway, so let's move on to, so now. Take it, take it back from. Uh, our podcast side of things you were very complimentary so th thank you very much for that I, I take the approach of i i normally do the introductions and i like to kind of maybe set the tone as far as moving between guests and moving things around i like the idea of talking a little bit and trying to clear out and let other people speak for me this is a great opportunity because this is the mo when toby and i first started the podcast it was a bit more us talking together and then as the natural rhythm flowed it was a bit more asking Toby questions and then as Vaughn Ad came into the mix I became much more of sort of the interviewer rather than interviewee and so while I do contribute and I do talk about my own thoughts on history and that kind of thing I try and take an approach of almost like an, an old school um, TV host who has someone interesting on the show and wants to hear what they want have to say yeah. and so I, I love having different people on and I love having Vaughn and Toby on because they will, as you say, they will dive into some really interesting stuff. And, you know, a lot of this stuff, I, I, I'll, or a good number of the stuff I, I've kind of researched myself, but there'll be some aspects that I won't have picked up on in my own research or things that I'll have thought about differently than they have. And for me, I think it's great that um, we have Toby and Vaughn who are not just really smart and know their stuff, but are so flexible at being able to, pick up new stuff on the fly which maybe you know we're going to do it uh, we've kind of moved through the different presidents so you know we toby and i did a, a, a trilogy on richard nixon and then we once vaughn joined we were uh, doing a, a trilogy on uh, ronald reagan and we've just finished or we're just in the process of we just finished our second show i think on bill clinton and you know as we move through this you know different people have their own kind of general knowledge about this but they're also pick up specific knowledge as we research it and so for me it's great because you know Vaughn's a, a genuine historian who's you know studying for a doctorate and Toby's got a master's in history and I'm not a historian I just love history and I, I, I like learning about it mm -hmm. and I, I like too. as it says you know sort of clearing out the way and letting letting other people speak so for me it's a great it's a great gig in that way. Okay so another question I had was Scottish were there Scottish shows that you watched as a child that were particularly Scottish or English yeah so growing up in the UK we had you had your British television that would British kids TV and British TV in general that would sort of mix an American TV with it so a lot of the sort of specific children TV would be a would be a mix of maybe more British stuff with more American stuff, and so you'd get you know your Rugrats being your American TV show or you know whatever other animated shows you'd have, but maybe you'd have more 
specific British programmes alongside that. Being Scottish, there would... It, it's an interesting mix because we basically have the BBC and ITV in, in Britain and certainly more so when I was younger but we, growing up we didn't have all the hundreds of thousands of TV channels I had you know four TV channels growing up as a kid and so you'd get a lot of it would basically we basically get the same programming for a lot of the time as English people would but that they would occasionally be a sort of break to be a bit more Scottish side of things you know maybe it would change after a certain hour of the day to represent maybe Scottish television. So there would always be an element of Scottishness mixed in growing up, but it was, I grew up feeling very British. My dad's side of the family is English. My mum's side of the family is Scottish. My sister was born in England. I was born in Scotland. So growing up, I felt very British um, and the TV probably reflected it being probably more British than Scottish, I would say. That makes sense. So then flash forward, you're, it seems like you just had a natural inclination towards looking at uh, media and film. You've got this focus on uh, American uh, pop culture and how uh, <clears throat> basically your, you know, each time period in American history is reflected in the media as film, especially, right? Film and TV. Yeah. So tell me about that and where do you want to go with that? So I did take, yeah, I did. I came here with an agenda, I'm afraid. Thank you. I appreciate that. That That's nice. I guess for myself, probably to start with is trying to maybe go through some of the, the how I now kind of look at media of the 20th century. So one of the examples I was going to give now was um, American sitcoms, which I think are actually a really interesting case study for this kind of thing. And it might not be something you would immediately jump on as thinking, oh, American sitcoms and history. But I think if you actually look at the American sitcom, it, it really does, it, it's a really good center point for both where American culture is at that time. And then also when you're looking back at the past, uh, from the future into the past, trying to understand where that culture was. And so there's a Marvel TV show on at the moment, which is called One Division, And it's basically a superhero show, but it's framed in the structure of a uh, sitcom dynamic, which is told every episode is basically through a different decade of that period. So you've got the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and, and so on. And so the first episode is like a 1950s black and white TV show. And the, the, the structure of the Honey, I'm Home America of the 1950s there's a certain element of truth of you know that actually being the dynamic of that time but there's also that that how that was framed in the media is now also how we take it in as well so as much truth as there's as there might have been specifically of that time of you know the the the, the nuclear family and this you know the husband coming home and the wife having the dinner on the table we also that's also been taken a step further because of the media that that has been representing it and so you've got this steady sort of change over the decades with American sitcoms up to sort of now where you have the the sort of the new normal as as it were, this idea of having greater inclusion and diversity with shows like Modern Family where, you know, you've got the gay couple, you know, adopting children, or you've got Gloria who's the, the young Latina wife. And it, you look at the, the contrast in how we deal with sitcoms today compared to the 1950s and sort of the gamut in, in between those decades it, i think it does it's an interesting depiction of american life and american media over that time uh, and what was telling about this show one division is that when they were depicting sort of the last decades they went for the modern family style telling off like the person speaking directly to camera which you see a lot in things like the office and parks and recreation and modern family and th that's how they're choosing to sort of depict the modern sit sitcom, which is, I think, interesting because it sort of asks questions of, well, is is that how we need to take in sitcoms these days? Do we need uh, the audience to kind of see it as a so the documentary style where they're speaking directly to camera and they're acknowledging the cameras around them? And does that sort of reflect the society now we live in where everyone's got a camera in their pocket and everyone's got a YouTube channel or... 
a, a blog or you know a, a podcast of their own you know it, 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 are we do we really reflect the culture we're in today through the, the sitcoms that were popular at the time and i think it's easy to see the the changes that are in media over the last 60 years as trivial but i think actually a lot of the time they are quite interesting and quite reflective of, of the time they're made and I, I think you can you can see that with uh sort of the, the style of sitcoms we have today compared to the 1950s wow i i thought that was interesting to kind of go back to that 1950s episode that you talked about um they tried to recreate the style, but was there anything in it that was definitely, you know, not like wrote from that time period, how it would have been, if that makes sense? The idea of one division, I suppose it's a little bit convoluted if you've not maybe seen the, the extended Marvel universe, but essentially you have this, these sort of two superhero characters, and one of them is essentially creating this fictional world around them. So the actual world that is around them is actually a, a creation of, of of this character and they appear to have almost fallen into this false world that they've created and the false world that they've chosen to create is through sitcoms and wow. so you have this thing where they will sometimes break the fourth wall because it's not a real sitcom and you know they'll they'll do things but at the same time they're also sort of depicting you know each episode will have you know the clothes and the setting and the music of that time period and you know the joke style of that time period and so you you if you were a 10 year old and you didn't know anything about 1950s america this might be your introduction to it and i guess that is i guess what's fascinating is this idea of here we have a 1950s sitcom you know sort of aesthetic which today is kind of you know put to one side we don't we need that style or we don't see ourselves that style but a 10 year old has now been reintroduced to that and they are learning about what TV sitcoms used to be like and what society used to be like. And, you know, this idea of the man was at work and, you know, he had his cigars and the woman was at home making the dinner. And and each, ep each episode being different, you, you start to have a look at how America saw itself during those time periods. And I think that's fascinating, the fact that we are always revisiting the 20th 20th century because it, it's such fertile ground for being able to tell stories. Yeah. Wow. Um, I don't think I'll, I'll ever be able to look at these shows again without that filter. And it's cool. It's actually kind of cool. So tell me more. Okay. So I suppose jumping ahead, um, I, I started thinking about, uh, the time period that I grew up in, which was the 90s. And, you know, I, I grew up being a teen teenager of the 2000s, sort of looking back at the films that had just come out. And so you had a sort of lot of films in the late 90s. So from my own point of view, I, I think when we get into the 90s, we have a, a very reflective cinema in, in that period. And there's a lot of films that kind of come out um, in the, the late 90s, which seem to follow a very similar pattern. So I picked out a few of them here, which basically follows this idea of trying to push beyond a safe boundary that of the modern world to try and find adventure or to try and find um, truth in a world which doesn't make sense to them or in a world that doesn't seem to fit. So you've got films like American Beauty, The Truman Show, Matrix, Fight Club, Office Space. They all feature white male leads in safe, comfortable office jobs who seem to break away from their realities and find truth or adventure by uh, breaking away from the false realities of modern life. So you've got things like, um, you know, breaking away from the, the, the modern life of things like Matrix and The Truman Show, where you've actually got an actual reality beyond that, or things like just trying to find meaning in the everyday life of like American Beauty and Office Space, which is you know, this repeated pattern of here we have a safe white life for this guy and everything seems on the surface like it's okay, but there's, there's something else kind of at play here and the reality that's constructed around them doesn't make sense to them anymore. And for whatever reason, there seems to be a lot of that happening in the late 90s. Um, things, in another film, for instance, is uh, Magnolia, which again was came out in 99, and 
two different scenes to pull out. What one is there's a scene where all the different characters that are set all around LA they all start singing the lyrics to the same song at, at the same time, and it almost becomes this sort of sing along moment, which kind of almost breaks reality for a moment. And then later in the film, it turns truly biblical and actually starts raining frogs from the sky. And so it, <laughs> it seems as if in the late nineties, there's uh, a, a move towards almost existentialism and this idea of what are we, what's the world around us actually, what does it mean? And, you know, we, we all take our own experiences into how we view art and in return art kind of reflects back at us in many different ways. And so perhaps when I analyze a film of the late nineties and I see contemporary settings where reality starts to break down, maybe I, I'm giving that an extra level of significance because I am wishing, you know, for a time before 9-11 where we appear to be heading for a future of possibilities, where we, you know, we were worrying about existentialism rather than, you know, a future based on fear. But I, I do think there is something to the, the movies of that time which kind of lends itself to being analysed. But on the kind of other side of that, you also have the view of these films of the late 90s where the characters don't believe in their real realities and, uh, you know, they seek to find, you know, a, a truth um, which is greater than the world presented to themselves. And perhaps on some level at, at that time, we knew that this golden period was kind of false and that it was built on a poor foundations. And what what was kind of happening now was about to break down. And indeed, what we see in the, you know, just a few years later in the 21st century, you know, a, a lot of those sort of things that we consider bad were sort of underneath the surface and just waiting to to sort of take hold, as it were. And so I, I think there are so many different ways you can analyse films and how many, you know, so many ways that other people can analyse films. And I think it's important that we do sort of pay attention to different interpretations because, you know, we will start to understand things in different ways. And, and just one final thing on this. Um, I think Fight Club is a really good example of something that maybe changes over time as well. So... That was a critique on modern society, especially around like corporate greed and consumerism. And yet perhaps its biggest legacy now is a, a lot more complex because its depiction of the, the righteous anger of the white man, you know, has actually inspired a generation of men to break away from society and consider women hostile and think taking power back through violence is how we deal with the world. And that's what sort of makes sense to them. And in fact, the film popularized using the term snowflake as an insult, which we see all, all over the internet today. And so whether or not you agree with that reading, you know, it doesn't mean that maybe the original text of it being a, a takedown of late 90s consumer driven America is, you know, inaccurate. I, I think art is so subjective that you could enjoy it on its sort of level as it may have come out in the 90s, but you can also look at it now as being very different because of what's come next and what is inspired. And so for me, that late nineties period is, is really interesting because it really did seem to start reflecting on what was happening. It, it, there did seem to be a common set of films that were, or a set of films that had a common theme of this white safe male character who was trying to break away from it. And I think looking back at it now, I think that's really interesting. That is interesting. Did you see what the Constitution means to me? I don't know if no. it's available. Well, it just reminded me of that. I love your take on that. This is fascinating to me, what you're talking about. It's a play. It was a play, and it was supposed to be traveling this year, uh, last year, but COVID. And so the premise the premise is this woman who, when she, true story, when she was 15 years old, she would travel around to um, <clears throat> these debates about uh, what the Constitution means to me. And it was all these kind of old, uh, <laughs> a lot of, you know, old fellows kind of organizations and stuff. And she won enough, I talked about it in my last episode, but she won enough money to put herself through college. And so she was this white, chirpy little blonde haired girl going around to these organizations and she won all this money. She revisits it as an adult. And that's kind of the premise. And I won't say any more, but your what you said about Fight Club was such an overarching explanation to me that I totally can see what you're saying. And she kind of goes back and talks about the history of, uh, you know, women and why women are afraid and how they act and all that. So I just really appreciated your kind of take on that. I recommend it, though. I'll cut that out. Um, I, I, 
I think there are so many different interpretations and you can take these things. And I think that's interesting what you say about, you know, women being afraid, because I think one of the things that we continue to struggle with or have struggled with certainly over the, the, the last, well, basically since cinema was invented, was this idea of trying to get a woman's perspective on film. And anytime you have more than one woman speaking at a time, suddenly it becomes a, a female film rather than just a film. And I think for, for audiences... I think it was Roger Ebert that said cinema was an empathy machine and, you know, it's about generating empathy and about generating understanding. And I think for a, a lot of men who would, you know, grow up and see, you know, Fight Club or Taxi Driver and say, oh, that's me. You know, the world doesn't understand me. I need to, you know, strike out and be different or whatever. You know, maybe if there was an opportunity at a younger age to, watch a, a more diverse set of entertainment, you know, be it, you know, foreign language films or female focused films, you know, maybe the, the idea of representation, maybe they would understand that actually the, the female character of, you know, a woman doing X, Y, Z, or, you know, someone in a different country doing X, Y, Z is as much a representation of them as, a, you know, a white man having some struggles in, the, you know, late 20th century or whatever the case may be. And uh, yeah, I think that's interesting with regards to, uh, women in cinema because we are starting to see a little bit more now with female directors getting a place in Hollywood but it continues to be a a, a struggle and I, I think that's something that we, we American American cinema and cinema in general but obviously American cinema is, continues to, to lead the way as far as just the industry you know how, how do we deal with making sure that women and, and, and people of, of color and different backgrounds you know they're able to tell their stories and a lot of the stuff I've touched on here um, has been the sort of standard white America perspective because growing up, that's what the stories that were being told outside of maybe something like Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, a lot of the entertainment that you saw on TV was, it was white characters, you know, it was their stories time and time again. And, you know, it's, it's too often it's the, it's the white male perspective on things. And uh, I think we need to continue to grow in that respect to, to move beyond that. Preach into the congregation, my friend. <laughs> what else? Okay. What else? Um, so I was also thinking about this um, in regards to my own perspective on this. And I, I kind of realized that watching these, these films and films in particular and some of these TV shows, I kind of became nostalgic at a young age. And so I became nostalgic not only of the... The, the things I have an interest for, you know, be it, you know, The Simpsons, but also my own experiences of it. So I think the the larger interests of the second half of the 20th century is based on, my own interest is based on nostalgia, uh, both in terms of the content created and also, you know, on the personal level, I was saying. And I think for many people my age uh, who grew up in the time of 9-11 and remember the news and the media before and after that event, there's kind of a, a clear line in the sand as to the tone of the news and the media. Uh, and in fact, a good example of that is the difference in, in tone of The War of the Worlds, which was made post 9-11, compared to Independence Day, which was made in the 90s. And both films are about aliens trying to invade Earth and causing massive destruction. But the tone of the films and their characters are polar opposites. And now we look back at both of those films from a distance and we can clearly kind of see the difference and how they represent the times in which they were made and the, the kind of hope or lack of hope that was in, in American society at that time. So was there more hope in Independence Day? Yeah, it's much more triumphant. It's much more... Uh, the, the basic concept yeah. is Amer these aliens have come to, you know, kick our butt and through American ingenuity, we're actually going to kick theirs. Whereas uh, War of the Worlds is a lot more hopeless. It's we're getting exterminated here. And then, follow, and then it follows the original story, which was they die out. The aliens essentially die out because they couldn't handle the the micro germs that were in our earth and you know it's it's the it's the the germs that basically defeat the aliens rather than any you know strike by military or anything like that and so independence day is about celebrating the earth's independence from this invading force whereas more the world is basically a kind of 9-11 on screen there's a lot of like you know buildings collapsing and dust covering people and beams destroying people into vapor and all this kind of stuff and it's quite 9-11 imagery put on screen and it is very much just trying to survive a slaughter more than anything else. And then we sort of 
win by accident almost, whereas Independence Day is, is a, a triumph of the world, and particularly yeah. America over the, the right. alien force. Yeah, wow, interesting. <laughs> I didn't see War of the Worlds, but I did see Independence Day. It's an I interesting think... film. I mean, it's it feels off its time. It does feel off that sort of post-9-11 things are a bit grim in America kind of thing. And I think looking back at it now, it, it, it does maybe feel off its time, but it, it still has some interesting parts to it. So as you're now analyzing these shows and movies as an adult, how do you see your world, your... Are they reflected at all in these movies? Because you keep referring to the American kind of mentality and point of view. Do you do you see yourself in any of that? I find it. I find it that I'm probably not. I don't feel like I'm seeing myself necessarily. Although there will be elements where, as I grow older, and you know, I, I got married a couple of years ago, and you know, we hope to have kids in the future. I'm sure there'll be representations of you know that kind of standard thing of, you know, waking up at 3 a.m. to change the babies or whatever it is that, you know, the, the natural element of seeing media that sort of, sort of reflects your age. And I suppose there's an element of when you're young and you're, you know, you're out with friends and you're going to clubs and you're drinking and you, that sort of more party lifestyle and the college lifestyle and maybe your first job kind of thing. There's an element of, of, of seeing some reflections on it, uh, um, my own life, but I'd say for the most part, it's probably more... I probably feel like I'm observing rather like I'm observing something else rather than necessarily I'm feeling like I'm being represented on, on screen. At least that's how I'm currently taking it. Maybe teenage Simon who saw the struggles of the various film characters and TV characters growing up, maybe I did feel more representative, but I couldn't say that now. I, f I feel like I am kind of watching a bit from a distance. That's interesting. All right. More, please. More, please. Okay. <laughs> so, um, my favorite TV drama of all time is Mad Men. Oh, I watched that. I watched all of it. Great. I, I, yeah. think, I think it's a really interesting show. And, you know, I, I, I think it, it's really smartly put together. And it depicts that, you know, the early 60s up from you know, 1960 to the early 1970s. And, you know, you kind of get that period, which, you know, I obviously didn't live through. And, you know, for, for me, it's, it's kind of a great depiction off that time period and of the certain characters and the sort of expectations of, of people within that society, be that, you know, men at work or, you know, women in the home, as it were, and, you know, dear God, don't let them in the office kind of thing. Or, you know, so I think for me that that's, it's almost so on the nose, the fact that that's my favourite TV show, it's almost too obvious. So Mad Men, I think, is a really interesting TV show because I think I think a lot of the writers were actually women, which I think was a nice change considering how male dominated a lot of the story is and how much of the perspective is men at work. And in fact, you know, when they, it'd be very easy. There's a difference between a show depicting sexism and a show being sexist. And I think you always have to be careful when you're kind of depicting that you don't cross over the line. Now, I would absolutely listen to any woman who would say that Mad Men was sexist. I I personally didn't find it sexist, but I could understand maybe they would. But um, the what you know, some of the sexism, especially in the early part, of the first couple of seasons, is you know they do represent it on screen. This idea of you know men in that time they drank and they saw women as objects, and um, it's it's a really interesting depiction for me about how. American life transforms, you know, I think the show starts in 1960, but it's the, it's not the 60s as, you know, we might think of it in kind of a very obvious way. It's still basically a hangover of the 50s. And it's not until later in the show that the 60s, as it were, actually gets going. And then you've kind of got the outside stuff of that. So, you know, you've got the different elections and the, the JFK assassination and Vietnam and that kind of thing. And then moving through to the seventies and the sort of change in culture there. And so from a purely historical document point of view, it's really interesting seeing basically the, the character shift from a sort of 1950s viewpoint to a 1970s viewpoint. And then there's obviously just the interpersonal stuff that I think plays out really well with the different characters as well. Yeah, I have to agree with you because when I'm thinking about it, I love the aesthetic. Yes, but absolutely. I, 
all through just everything. I agree with you. It wasn't it wasn't sexist. It was really showing us what it looked like. Yeah. And we're able to judge from this viewpoint. And it, they did it beautifully. And I'll never forget that first episode with the cigarettes because my dad was a lucky strike smoker. And everything about it. Oh, I got to go back and watch it. But yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. And I didn't I didn't know that it was a lot of women writers. I really didn't know that. I could be wrong, but from my understanding, I think there was a lot of female writers involved in the show, which I think does help. I mean it was I think it was Matthew Weiner, I think was the the guy who created the show. But I, from what I understand within the writing room, I think there were a number of female writers, which helps when you are trying to tell a show which depicts sexism, you know. I, I think making sure that, that is balanced out, I think, is, is very important. That was one of the few series that I really watched every single episode mm -hmm. of yeah. and couldn't wait till the next one came out. So what else about Mad Men? Uh, Mad Men. Um, I think we kind of touched on a little bit there, but I think just the, the aesthetic is so different and so well like crystallized. And you do feel that you are in that world. It's not just a case of like you're watching a play that's supposed to take place during this time and you've got some stories like the the, the costumes that they're wearing and the the ability to sort of transform you into this world which like is kind of the way i look at america and it of contemporary times and it seems you know like my world but different it's kind of like that looking back in the period of, of like the 50s to the 70s which isn't so far removed from our time but at the same time it's different enough that the you know they can go into a restaurant and smoke but just kind of expanding from that, I, when I was thinking about Mad Men, it kind of, it did sort of start me thinking about when I started taking in or seek out film or TV like that, and how much of that is, did I seek that out because it, it was just one of the things that was available, or did I seek it out because I genuinely had an interest in this? And I, I thought back, and I was thinking for my... 14th birthday I think it was we went to see Catch Me If You Can in the cinema which was the Spielberg film with Tom Hanks and Leonardo DiCaprio yep. and I didn't realise at the time but that was probably me following a pattern that I'd established at a younger age about seeking out content that gave me a chance to visit the 20th century and Catch Me If You Can I think is again a really good example of a film being set in that time which is you know a time period I'm really interested in and you know, there's a there's an example of me going out of my way and going right. Let's go, let's go watch that. And growing up in the Highlands of Scotland, you know, it was like an actual proper day trip to go to the cinema. You know, and so to yeah. to, to take you know one of the, one of the few times that year we'll go into cinema was to watch Catch Me If You Can, which you know for me was a really enjoyable film and is something which almost set the tone for some of my interests going forward. That was a good film. He was such an unlikable character. <laughs> uh, there was another film that came out in the early 2000s called Almost Famous, which was about a, a fictional rock band in the 70s or late, late 60s, early 70s, I think it was. Yeah. And um, I would have, I was too young to have seen that in the cinema, but I got the DVD when I was a teenager and you kind of just rewatch it and you take in, you know, another example of, taking in the world of the 20th century through the, the films that you see. And, you know, you know, growing up, you know, music was a big part of my life as a teenager. And, you know, I wasn't listening to a lot of rock music and, you know, American rock music and all this kind of thing. And what, were, what did you listen to? So I suppose when I first got into music, it was things that were kind of popular at the time. So it was things like, you know, the Foo Fighters or the Red Hot Chili Peppers or, you know, that, that kind of early 2000s rock music and then you start to look back at the, the 90s music and then you're listening to you know nirvana or you know things like that and you f f kind of naturally i suppose start to get certain tastes of things that are similar to the things that are popular or sort of semi-popular of, of your time and so uh, again there's a lot of seeking out i think i think american music which was kind of continuing the pattern of taking in American media as it were and so you listen to an American song and maybe they're singing about a, a life which is very similar to yours but again it's an American voice singing it and so I suppose it just repeats that pattern of um, going to an American to, to listen to about life or listen to about rock music yeah oh interesting have you been here? 
I've I've never been no. It's oh. something I'd I as a teenager. It was like oh when I'm young, you know when I'm older, I'd really like to visit California, and that was something I'd be really interested in. And life kind of gets in the way, you know. You 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 go to college and you get a job, and then suddenly years pass and you're saving up, and then oh there's a wedding to pay for, and then suddenly yeah. COVID hits, and it, it it's <laughs> it's one of those things that uh, I would I would very much like to make the trip and i'm sure i will one day but um yeah n not had the chance yet yeah that's how i feel about england well i didn't actually travel to england until i was 50 so it's never too late Simon. too late yeah what else i know you've you've got our path cut out for us so i'm just so well probably the, the last thing that i really had noted down was um i was thinking of a, a film which I've only seen parts of. I've never actually seen the whole thing, which is a film called Pleasantville that, that came out in 1998, which is kind of a, a, a sort of natural extension to Back to the Future. So Back to the Future, you know, you have them actually going back to the 1950s, whereas Pleasantville, I believe they actually go inside the TV show off a 1950s sort of setup. And so it, it, it's, as I say, it's sort of a natural extension of we're no longer just going back to the actual time period. We're actually traveling inside the media of that time or a media depiction of that time. And it started, again, driving back this idea of nostalgia and how much nostalgia is often a driving force within media. And they they have this thing which they refer to as the 30-year cycle. Um, and so as, as the 50s was the go-to nostalgia era for a lot of TV of the films, uh, film and TV of the 70s, 70s and 80s, so you've got like Happy Days and Back to the Future and Stand By Me, the 80s has become the era of, of choice over the last decade. So you have like Stranger Things, The Americans, It, um, the film that came out not long ago. So I, I, I guess, again, going back to this idea of nostalgia, we've got this nostalgia at the moment for the 1980s and for a lot of the culture around that. And I was thinking, you know, <laughs> who knows, maybe 30 years from now, they'll feel really, really nostalgic for people, you know, binge watching Netflix and starting their own podcasts. I, I, don't, I don't know, but uh, it, it's funny how that, that happens. And, you know, maybe maybe in a few years' time, we'll be really um, nostalgic for the 90s, you know? I, I, I guess it, it's it's always interesting how these things, the things play out and how we seem to look back on a certain time period. And I guess part of that is just as people age, as different generations move forward and as they become the sort of uh, group who ha maybe has a certain power within media, there's a certain uh, natural element of it's that era or now we're going back to reflect upon. And so maybe that's that's why a lot of the culture... I mean, we had Wonder Woman 1984, which is a Wonder Woman film that came out last year set during the 80s. You know, that's the time period that they wanted depicted in. So... You know, I, I find that really interesting, this idea of nostalgia. That is interesting. So is that a phenomena, this 30-year cycle you're talking about? Yeah, so I believe it's sometimes referred to as a 25-year cycle or 20-year cycle. There seems to be some discussion as to exactly the specifics, but certainly the 30-year cycle, I think, is the, the most famous out of those. And it's this idea that you give yourself 30 years and it's that time period that you're looking back on. So as I said, a lot of uh, content of the, the 80s was looking back at the 1950s and a lot of content now is looking back on the 1980s. Well, that's interesting too, because Eric Escobar, who was my last episode, he chose the 80s to talk about. And I lived through all that stuff. You don't realize as you're living through it that it's history. And then when it people start reflecting on it, the younger generations, and then you, you're like, yeah, that I guess it was history. And then now like that I'm getting even older in the eighties. Um, you know, I, I see that I do see that cycle you were talking about. <laughs> Absolutely. And it, it's one of those things where I, I think you quite rightly say, maybe you live through a period and you don't you don't think of that as history. I mean, we're we're coming up to the twentieth anniversary of, of nine eleven and all, 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 you know, and all that kind okay. of thing, which is quite amazing to think how, how quickly time passes. And it, it, it's funny, you don't think, oh, maybe life was that different 20 years ago, but just even just technology, this idea of, you know, we had flip phones and no one was really on the internet or it's not to the same extent that, you know, everyone is online to today. And so, yeah. you know, 
I didn't have the internet in the two thousands, you know, and now I'm online all the time. And you know, kids growing up today will just grow up in this internet time, and that's all they'll ever know. Whereas I grew up essentially pre-internet, really, and some of the even just some of the things like you look at the fashion of the two thousands, you think, can the world really be that different? And you actually go, yeah, some of the yeah. fashion of the two thousands was genuinely terrible. How did we? How did we decide to live that way? So maybe- see, I don't, I don't see that. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't see that fashion is just eighties had distinct definitely yes. fashion. Nineties, I, I guess they did have a, have a fashion, but mm-hmm. I don't know what it was. Well, how would you just? Would you describe the fashion of the 2000s then? So looking over the last sort of 10, 15 years, there does, there, you look at like a pair of jeans, for instance, which is a really kind of insignificant item in in some regards, but actually a pair of jeans quite often reflects what that society is. So I was watching the film Clueless the other day, which is the sort of the the adaption of, of, of Emma, which is really good from the 90s. And one of the things that that film comments on is the men of that time are wearing really baggy jeans that are basically falling off them. I mean, really baggy jeans. And by the 2000s, they weren't sort of, there were some really massive jeans in their own respect, but it was in a slightly different way. So it wasn't quite hanging off them quite the same, but they were sort of flared mm-hmm. towards the bottom in a very distinctive way. And in fact, if you look at a lot of the, 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 sort of t- the young teen TV stars of that time when they'd walk red carpets. It's actually really cringeworthy to think now, but quite a lot of, sort of the teenage pop stars of sort of the early to mid 2000s were wearing like a skirt with jeans underneath them. And it, it's that sort of thing which people will look back on now and go, why were they wearing both jeans and a skirt? That's a really odd choice. <laughs> and so maybe we'll, maybe we'll look back from like 10 years ago when skinny jeans really came in and they'll go, yeah. wow, everyone's jeans were really skinny for a while, weren't they? And yeah. you know maybe we'll feel as much embarrassment about that as as we did for for certain time periods. But um, there are you know like, like I I was never what they called an emo that that was never my scene. But you you, you look back at a lot of emo kids off the sort of the late two thousands and early two thousand tens, and you know they've got a very distinctive look. And most of them are grown up now, sort of my age, and they have for the most part probably grown out of that. And for that for them they probably felt that was a real cultural identity for them but yeah. looking back now they probably think oh maybe for some of them may feel that oh that's a little embarrassing you know my hair was a certain style or my jeans were a certain style or i spoke in a certain style and you know everyone lives through that and everyone has different experiences of of, of what they wear and how, well and then you know? and then and then it's going to come back in and the younger kids are going to think it's cool i've lived this every decade <laughs> But I actually am kind of embracing the 80s again, I have to say. Is there anything else about this history that um, you want to share? I'm, tr- I'm trying to think now. I mean, I suppose from my own perspective, when Toby and I first started the podcast, we were looking for a name of a podcast and we were I was sort of scratching around trying to come with different ones and I was kind of looking at different things and then I saw this Oscar Wilde um, sort of document, I suppose. It was... It, it, he had this writing called Impressions of America, which was as a, you know, someone from one side of the pond kind of going over to America and his perspectives on America. And I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting, you know, that that's uh, Impressions of America. He, he's getting these Impressions of America from, you know, his his time traveling there. And for Toby and myself growing up, we were getting these impressions of America from the media we were taking in and from the news we were taking in, the film, the TV and the music. And I I think it's kind of fitting that we ended up doing a podcast called Impressions of America. And I'm talking to you today about 20th century history and 20th century media, because we did get impressions of America as, as as it were. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, I, I've not lived in America. I can't tell you what American life is genuinely like, but I can tell you about the impressions we got off America for through film and television and news and through the, the history that is told. And um I guess that's that's the kind of story behind the name of the podcast because it kind of reflected our own experience of taking in America as it were. I love it. It's brilliant. As the as the starting point for us to move forward is both our own impressions of America and also when we look at these sort of snapshots of different parts of American life, you know, the, the impressions that they sort of 
leave on America, you know, whether it's Richard Nixon, as we often joke about, or it's any other character, you know. We'll get back to Nixon. We're going to talk about him. <laughs> I have to say that I find it really helpful listening to your experience and trying to fit my head into what that was like. You know, it makes me a little bit more open to the differences and kind of over the past 20 years have really been understanding the American personality and how we're perceived by other cultures, other countries and that type of thing. Uh, feeling a little shamed of it, I have to say. I'm trying to be more accepting of that identity. I find it really helpful to listen to your experiences and that, you know, coming from Scotland and be your impressions and what that's like. Uh, it, I don't know. It, it, I feel like we're more connected that way. It makes me understand things better. I didn't say that well, but... No, I, un I, I understand what yeah. you mean, yeah. I, I suppose it's... It, in a way, I always feel a little bit guilty because if someone, if an American started talking about impressions of Scotland and, you know, started trying to view our country through media and through history, you know, it, it's very easy for me as a person not living in America to, you know, be critical or to analyse certain things in a certain way and not have to live with the fact that that is my identity, as it were. And I think for Vaughn, although I don't want to speak for her, it's a bit different because although she's now living on our side of the pond, as it were, and she will be critical of, of America in many different aspects, she is still, you know, she grew up in America, she has, you know, family and friends in America, she still has part of her identity as being an American. And so... I, I, we are often critical about certain aspects of of American life and s certain things that don't make sense to us, or certain figures who have brought shame on America, or whatever the case may be. And there are, you know, instances where, you know, one of the great bugs I have with America is quite often certain Americans will proclaim America the greatest country as if that were a thing that could possibly be a thing, you know how you can describe any country as the single greatest country, I don't, I don't understand. I, I guess, putting all that to one side, America is a fascinating country and it has so much going on that is both good and bad and indifferent and all the areas in between. And I, I never want to feel like I'm completely destroying a country which has given so much back to me and it would kind of feel false if, if I were completely critical of, American considering how much interest I have in it and you know I will pick apart we all will pick apart things that we don't like about you know America or American life or American culture or American films or whatever the case may be but at the same time I don't want to be unhelpfully critical of a country because there are so many great Americans who are doing great things every single day that you know there are people right now who are helping people in Texas, you know, with the struggles they're going through and are doing fantastic work. And I don't know any of their names and they're doing all these things right. without, you know, fame or glory. And they're doing, you know, great work. And I'm sitting back and I'm reading a summary of one perspective of the news of, of Texas. And I'm somehow, you know, quote unquote, informed about it. And I, I, yeah. I never want to feel like I somehow know more about America than the people on the ground. And I guess that's one of the things that we have to try and juggle on the podcast is... But you, you know about America from your perspective of it. And I think that you guys are very self-reflective and you're very thoughtful. You're uh, very educated. You know, I've come to terms somewhat with who we are um, by being outside of the country and traveling in Europe and that type of thing. And... I don't I think you guys bring a really important perspective and sometimes it's it might be subtle but I think I wish that more American people would understand what we look like from the other side. I think that would maybe help us help some of us but we we deserve a lot of the criticism we get and I I'm not offended by it. You know, we have to come to terms with that. So the podcast, I think we've kind of naturally segued to that. Uh, I do want to ask you one more thing. <clears throat> what is the thing that you want to leave my listeners with about this history? What's your message? Um, I suppose the history that we've been discussing today, I, I guess the thing I'd, I'd like to leave with them is this idea that it's not that far away at all. 
and it's a lot closer with respect to both the the themes that are happening in America today and also the the people that are still in power as it were and I, I guess with any history part of the point of studying it is to learn from it and to understand the lessons from it and I think it'd be very easy to say look at some of the things that happen in America today and thinking how outrageous and crazy they are and thinking this is some sort of fluke and you know there have been lots of things that happened in America in the well in the time period I'm discussing in particular you know because that's stuff we're going on about today but you know much further back as well which really does reflect how America is right now and I, I know it kind of feels like America is in a different point because Trump was so outrageous and you know we had the the Capitol riots which you know haven't seen in 200 years you know all, all the things today which seem so different but I, I suppose the thing if, if I can leave anything with the audience would be there is so much to unpack from the last 50 years and maybe consider how we view how the media has is now viewing some of the events of the last 50 years and how things are being framed and think about that as we view things today and as we move forward and you know i can't imagine any of your listeners right now would be on the trump side of things so i don't really feel like i'm trying to ter ter turn turn i think i've gotten rid of all those <laughs> by my politics we're trying to win over anyone new in that regard <laughs> but I, I guess a lot a lot of what i've been talking about is just considering how we frame the news and events of today and think about how we've been viewing and framing the events of the past 50 years and think right could we have done a better job at the time and can we do a better job of today and you see some of the, the falsehoods of how certain things were framed at the time with regards to, you know, rights for women or, or black people voting or, or, or things like that. And we have to continue to hold the people accountable, both in the positions of power actually making these decisions, but also the, the media that's sort of supposed to be representing us and informing us. And, you know, there are good things and bad things as far as how things were depicted in the past. And, let's try and learn the lessons of that as we move forward. And if things aren't being held to the high enough standard where, you know, we see a lot today where a lot, a lot of things happened with the Trump presidency was Trump would say something outrageous, which was completely false. And but be framed as, you know, Trump says that the moon is made out of cheese. Democrats disagree. <laughs> and rather than it being, you know, Trump lies about what the moon is made out of. Yeah. We, we should be continuing to ha hammer, you know, whether it's, politicians or whether it's the media or whoever it is you know we, we must try and be critical of what's happening today the same way as we'd be appalled if we saw i don't know a, a film from the 1960s that said it was okay to slap a wife if she became hysterical or something like that you know it, oh it, you yeah know, it, it, it's we, we have to try and you know things like you know uh trans rights that are happening right now in you know in america and in britain one of the, one of the things that's a big fight you know as to how things like um, uh, transgender rights are being portrayed in the media. And you only have to look back at how rights for women and rights for other minorities have been framed over the 20th century to see that this is almost a, a sad, natural sort of reaction to, you know, as soon as someone tries and gets their rights, which is, you know, what they should be doing, a lot of the establishment is to knock that down and to frame them in a in a bad way. And we have to try and learn that lesson that, you know, it wasn't okay to do that to, to women and to black people. And it's not okay to do that to transgenders. Yeah, Just as an yeah. example. Beautiful. That's beautiful. You're right. Okay. Podcast impressions of America. So you, you and Toby started this. Yeah. And that was in 2018, I think. That uh, was probably correct. I'm losing all concept of time, to be honest. I mean, it's now okay. apparently 2021, but it could be 2046 <laughs> or it could be 1997. Right. I'm not really sure at this point. Okay. So yeah, that, and so it was, it's, <laughs> it started out with you and Toby and Twitter. Twitter. Yeah. We, we became friends just through someone mutual. And then we started messaging and we we're like, right, let's get a podcast together because that's what men in their twenties do, apparently. Um, so we 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 got a podcast together and we we started talking about what we were interested in, which was specifically 
um, sort of that 1960s period of, you know, a lot of stuff, or 1960s and 70s, we I think our first one was on the, the post to the film about Watergate scandal, and then we did a lot of stuff around Richard Nixon and um, some other things around like counterculture and lo- those kind of things. And f- from there, we started to sort of e- extend as the, you know, some of the guests we'd have on. So we, we'd have, you know, historians or we'd have who, whoever on to speak about, you know, maybe their books or we had, um, um, you know, different different perspectives and different topics. And then it was, I think, as Vaughn said, it was about a year ago that uh, Toby we, Toby somehow found Vaughn in the annals of the internet and reached <laughs> out. And um, yeah, Vaughn was interested. I, I think I think it might might have been something along the lines of maybe becoming a researcher to begin with, and then become a a co-host if she was interested and she was and one of the great th- one of the many great things about Vaughn is she somehow fits about a thousand different things into a day I don't know how she does it she does so I much I have no idea it, she struggles with her illness too. yes it, it's genuinely astonishing I, I amazing I, I feel tired enough trying to fit in a full-time job in the podcast and yeah. or, you know spending some time with the wife I don't know how she does all the things she does in a day yeah and she you know she was great and she adds a different voice and I think the if we have had any success over the last year in particular with regards to our chemistry, I think Vaughn has been a, a great part of that because just having, I think having any third voice adds something to it. But I think having someone as interesting and as informed as Vaughn has been a real blessing for the show. So I, I think it, it, it's been great for ourselves to, to add Vaughn in and, you know, we continue to diff- do different shows and talk about different things and, you know, hopefully that continues for for a while yet. Yeah, yeah. I'm really impressed by all your knowledge, all of you guys. Like you can you can talk about anything, and you have so much information. What else do we need to know about the podcast? I'm trying to think if there's anything else we need to add, other than the fact that when I listened to the Vaughn episode, you did quiz her about Richard Nixon and Toby and my okay. interested in Richard Nixon. So maybe we should set the record clear on that one. Okay, uh, because. Really, what won me over to your podcast, it was actually a conversation with Vaughn on Twitter, and I was listening to your episode on one-term presidents, and it was Vaughn. It was not you guys, I have to say, because she came out of the gate saying, well, Jimmy Carter was my favorite president, and I, I've never had that conversation with anybody, but, you know, so I was a kid. My dad was a staunch Republican yelling at Jimmy Carter. And I just remember, like, I knew my own mind back then. I didn't speak it, but I knew it. And I, you know, love Jimmy Carter. And so as a human being, I know that he got chewed up and spit out by the political climate and the world. And, you know, but he still was and is a good person. And and in my heart of hearts, that's what I wish would work. Yes, and I, I think if we were, if we were being serious, I think we'd we'd all agree that <laughs> Jimmy Carter was a thoroughly better person than pretty much any president that's come before or after. To be honest, Jimmy Carter yeah. comes across as a genuine person who who cares about other people, which in itself seems a rare skill in politicians these days. Vaughn probably correctly says that you know she she does think of him as it hit as her favorite president i don't have a favorite president because i find the concept of a favorite president odd and incorrect i don't th- <laughs> i think you can like at the moment uh aoc i think is a really interesting politician i think she does great things and i think it's great that we have someone who is both so as info- as well informed as she is and also someone who is able to communicate the way she does particularly to a younger audience but this idea of sort of having a sort of fanboy interest in a president or being really sort of reverential towards a president, okay. I find that a really difficult concept, partly because I think having that for anyone in political office is kind of dangerous because they should be representing us rather than us being a fan of them. And the idea of someone being a politician should be them working for us and they should never feel as if they've automatically got our vote. You know, they they should have to win it through their actions and, you know, their deeds, as it were. So for me, anyone being a favourite politician or a favourite president is kind of an odd concept. 
And to build on that part of what I find odd about the idea of having a favourite president as well is, as it stands now, so much of the job of being a president is to make some really terrible decisions and do things, specifically around things like whether or not you invade another country or whether or not you do, you know, you blow up a building because it's some sort of retaliation, you know, standard protocol thing, which I, I just, it's a very foreign concept, I think, for anybody really to understand about how you make a decision of taking another person's life, you know, in a cold calculated manner in that sort of, of fashion. And I think it's really difficult for American presidents these days to have to deal with that type of foreign policy where they are making decisions about whether or not they should strike back against terrorists if it means, you know, killing innocent people. Because the idea of sort of taking a box from 5,000 miles away and killing someone is so foreign and it should seem so ugly. And so anyone who has to make that decision, there's an element of I feel sorry for them, but there's also an element of I also can't really celebrate them in any way because they are still doing that act. But that, that's sort of an aside. But on specifically on the Richard Nixon thing, uh, Toby and I, I mean, I'll speak for myself, Richard Nixon growing up in the sort of time period I grew up in the 90s, he was a cartoon character. He was okay. he was appearing in The Simpsons or what you know whatever it was. And it was, you know, this ridiculous caricature who was who did these bad things and was always, he, he, you know, he was like a cartoon villain, as it were. And so there's an element of just enjoying the character of Richard Nixon in that regard and thinking of him as this sort of extension of American political life, which is sort of beyond normality, as, as it were. So there's an element of that. Then there's an element of Toby and I just having fun with the idea of picking someone to like that other people clearly would dislike for obvious reasons. Uh, okay. There's an element of just like, oh, we love Nixon just because. There's also, there's probably a small percentage of Nixon actually was, for all his flaws, and he had many flaws, he was actually a relatively skilled politician. And, you know, he actually achieved things. And, he, you know, he's someone who worked his way up. And, you know, he was vice president when he was 40. And, you know, he was should have won the 1960 election, but was essentially cheated out of that. And, you know, for all the many things Richard Nixon did wrong, there's at least some sort of skill to his career and, you know, some of the things that he, he achieved, um, whereas, you know, some precedents, um, I can't always say that for, because they sometimes sort of just seem to stumble into office, um, you know, <laughs> such as some recent examples. Uh, but yeah. N Nixon is a... Nixon is a fun character because he was he was almost a boogeyman for a more innocent time where the worst thing he ever, well, the worst thing he is proclaimed to have done with Watergate, which I don't think was the worst thing he actually did. I think, you know, if you look at some of the things with regards to, you know, Cambodia bombings and things, I think that had a much bigger impact on, on people's lives than, than Watergate. So I think there, as much as we joke about, you know, Nixon as a character, we also have to take into account that him, like a lot of presidents, did, you know, some truly awful things, which, you know, you would never feel good about joking about. But you kind of sometimes have to put that to one side and just enjoy the caricature element of, Nixon is the bogeyman for the, the sort of 20, later 20th century for American yeah. presidents. And he's the one that we should all try and not be like. And then, of course, Trump came along and was just the most ridiculous version of anything that anyone had ever been. And now Trump is just so far beyond anything that Nixon was. It's 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 almost, like I say, a more innocent time to think back that Nixon was the bogeyman. Yeah, it is. Well, and then the other thing is that at least Nixon resigned. <laughs> But I mean, he really didn't have a choice. He had to because his own brothers were coming down on him. But I, I think there's an element of Nixon was a bad person in some respects, but he was still a person. I honestly don't think you could describe Donald Trump in normal human, like a normal human framing. I genuinely think there's something basically psychotic about him. Like, I don't think he has an understanding of reality the same way yeah. people do. I think he has no concept of things like genuine patriotism or genuine sort of compassion for people. I don't think he has any interest in making America better. He only has interest in making, you know, his pockets larger or defrauding people or having fun taking, you know, lollipops from children or whatever it is. Whereas yeah. <laughs> Nixon, for all his faults, I think he did have some sense of, you know, trying to make certain aspects of America better. But obviously Nixon did lots of terrible things and we don't try and gloss over that, but it's still yeah. fun to to think of the caricature of Nixon. And especially now with Trump, who is, 
Um, I get it. Yeah. And even even not just Trump, you know, some of the terrible things that George W. Bush did, for instance, you know, and, you know, you only have to look at the war in Iraq and, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, you know, died or having to move home and, you know, some of the terrible things. And it, it's, it's, yeah, like I say, it kind of comes back to this idea of having a favorite American president. It's, for me, that's such a foreign concept. So I understand what Vaughn means by Jimmy Carter being hers. But I don't think yeah. I could ever proclaim, other than Nixon, just for comedy reasons, I don't think I could ever proclaim anyone to be my favorite president. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> you, do you have a favorite prime minister? The, I think that's... Uh, the same. No, yeah, I, I don't... Th it, it's funny, this isn't one thing that has been brought up so far, but part of the reason that Toby and I started the podcast, and this is something we mentioned before, is talking about American politics, there's a certain distancing that we can take where the things that are happening in America, good or bad, big or small, we are somewhat removed from that and it's not affecting yeah. our daily lives. I could not do a podcast about British politics and I couldn't talk about Brexit and I couldn't talk about Boris Johnson on day. You know, I just, I would just lose the will to live if I had to t talk about that <laughs> on a weekly basis. So there is definitely an, an element of needing distance to talk about things like politics and history, which talking about america allows us that distance it's like mm -hmm. part of it is it's sort of the biggest stage so it's kind of the most fun to talk about but also it's a distant stage and even things that might sort of touch upon our reality you know british troops were involved in the iraq war for instance we're still framing it around the american side of things rather than necessarily the british side of things and it, it it's rare that we'll talk about the british side of things on the podcast we'll it's just... too personal yeah too emotional no oh, yeah so for toby yeah. and i i think we, we see that as a as a way to right. sort of distance ourselves from it what do you see in the future of the podcast the future of the podcast immediate future will just be a sort of continuation of, of where we are are at with the th three of us we've been quite politics heavy over the last year or so because we've been as well as doing the history side of things we also have been doing a lot of uh, current politics as well because you know we have an interest in that and that that sort of plays into a similar theme so we did a lot of stuff around the the election both pre and post now that trump's out the way and we've got over the hump of the election we're hopefully going to be doing fewer episodes i'd say on the actual current policies and the current politics of today and we'll probably also for a while move away probably from the presidential side of things maybe break away and do some more sort of self-standing episodes that are about specific things maybe a bit more on the, the, the film side of things we've talked about maybe doing things on a local sort of state level rather than necessarily on a Oh, um, on a national level so it might be that we you know look at some of the stories of things like new york or massachusetts there, there are so many you know ways you could in you could frame a, a podcast which is about you know american history as it were and one of those yeah. things could be you know um new york on film for instance or the certain stories of how new york's evolved from the 60s and 70s to you know the, the giuliani years of the 80s and you know the the 2000s post 9 11 you know there there are things that we could do on a state level and stories that we could tell which we've not really gone into when we've been doing telling things at a national level so, so that's something that i think we could be exploring in, in the future oh i look forward to that so where do we find you guys so our twitter is at usa impressions i think uh, the Impressions of America podcast should be available on all platforms, your Spotify's and your iTunes and everywhere else you get your podcasts. Impressionsofamerica.com, which uh, we sometimes put uh, different articles up on there. So yeah, th there's various ways that you can contact us. We're always, always happy to be uh, sought out as it were. So yeah. Simon, thank you so much for being here today. I really enjoyed talking to you. Well, thank you for having me on. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. And thank you for not falling asleep as I rambled. So. Oh, I hung on there. I literally hung on every word. I, lo I love this stuff. I really do. So, all right. Well, you have a good rest of your Saturday. Thank you. Same to you. There you have it. Simon Heptonstall, co-host of Impressions of America podcast. For more information, be sure to check out the episode notes and do look for another episode in which I interview 
Toby Alawa, who is the third and final co-host of Impressions of America, coming up in just a few weeks. Thanks for listening today. Have a great week.